Hello, my name is Matthew Shaw and I'm the librarian here at the Queen's College and I'm standing in front of the Peat Library where today Professor Richard Parkinson and Chris Hollings are going to tell us about that library and uh, the contents within it and how it came to be here in, at Queen's College. Well, I was a student at Queen's and the Peat Library was really the centre of a lot of Egyptologists' um, existence. But it was very much just a name, and I didn't know that much about um, Pete as a person until you, Chris, started working on him as a mathematician and as a historian. Yeah, so, so Pete came to Queen's in 1901. Um, there seems to have been some uh, debate over whether he would pursue mathematics or classics, and he came on a, a mathematical scholarship but ended up uh, taking double honours in mathematics and classics um, um, and then when he left in 1905 he went into an archaeological career and was involved in uh, excavations in Malta and uh, in Italy um, before going to Egypt in uh, 1909 um, and this seems to have been simply for practical reasons he needed paid employment and the Egypt Exploration Fund was, uh, was, was paying him um, and this seems to have been what sparked his interest in, in Egyptology, certainly on top of the, the archaeology. Um, and this is where he met Alan Gardner, uh, who also features in the story. Indeed. Um, and um, he studied ancient Egyptian languages. He um, increasingly turned towards philological work, but seems also to have retained an interest mm. in mathematics. So perhaps it wasn't such a matter of expertise in mathematics as such, but it was an interest in mathematics that led him to uh, to seek to, to produce a new edition of the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus. Um, there was a, an edition from the 1870s, which was by this point thought to be uh, slightly out of date. So yeah. he, in about 1911, he started working on, on this. It was eventually published in 1923, um, by which point he was Professor of Egyptology in, in Liverpool. Yes, yes, and, and I think this is where Gardner creeps into the, the story again. I mean, Gardner was, well, never held a major academic post, um, but he came from a very wealthy family. His, his father was in commerce in textiles. Uh, Gardner was disgustingly wealthy um, and for all his life refused academic posts, saying he didn't need them. And he used his funds to really bolster the subject. And he was a prodigious scholar, but he was his influence, the invisible colleges, as, as Claire Lewis calls them, were, were so influential. And really, thanks to him, Pete was appointed as the reader um, of Egyptology, um, who was really intended to succeed Griffith, the first um, professor of Egyptology and a fellow of Queen's, of course. Um, now, Pete came from not the sort of family that was expected to produce academics at the time and was what Gardner termed of slender means and therefore he couldn't survive on the salary of the reader and you know, from our work in the college archives it, it's clear Gardner was negotiating and manoeuvring and giving money in order to persuade the university to convert the readership into a full professorship which would, would sustain Pete um, and this happened, was happening shortly after Pete was appointed as reader and had given his inaugural lecture. Um, but at that point, um, possibly very sensibly given the, the nature of the job, he died. Um, and so he never, if you read accounts, you can see he's the professor of Egyptology, he never quite made it, he was the professor elect. And again, what Gardner did then, I think, very characteristic. He bought Pete's library and presumably Pete's widow needed the money and then he donated it to the college. And that really was the moment at which the Pete library came into existence. There was a collection of books from Sace, who was Griffith's predecessor as the, the professor of ancient Near Eastern studies. Um, but with the donation of Pete's library, it became a very major collection of Egyptology books. And of course it has Pete's own copies, Gardner's own copies of very many things, which of course means it, it has archival potential, as, as you know very well. 
Yes, yeah, so I was interested in um, uh, an Austrian historian of mathematics, Otto Neugebauer, uh, sort of on a, a project that had nothing to do with, with wow. Egyptology. Um, and he was um, beginning his career in the, the 1920s, and I was doing general uh, biographical background on him, and it turns out that the Peat Library has a copy of his dissertation. Um, and inside the dissertation uh, were copies of letters from um, from Neugebauer to Piet, um, discussing various aspects of um, ancient Egyptian mathematics. Um, and they're very interesting letters. They, um, they give you a good impression of the, the different directions from which Piet and Neugebauer were approaching this topic. You have Neugebauer uh, very embedded in the, the Göttingen mathematical mm. tradition in which he'd been brought up, which looks to to find overarching principles, um, sort of lay down fundamental principles, very, very much a systematization of of history, or and in this case of uh, uh, the development of ancient Egyptian mathematics. And this is in great contrast to Pete, who is very cautious. He doesn't really want to go very much beyond uh, what's actually there mm. in the in the sources. Um, and um, so there seems to have been a wider correspondence in the 1920s, but we only have these two letters that were in the book. Um, and of course, the reason for the correspondence was uh, Pete's edition of the, yes. the Rhine Papyrus. Yeah, and I, I think, again, one can see Gardner's influence in getting him to work on, on that. And the, the Papyrus is in the British Museum. I, I, I used to curate it without until we met knowing anything about the mathematics in it. Um, and I, I, I do wonder whether Gardner, knowing Pete had done maths as an undergraduate, steered him towards it, because it's one of his first works on Egyptian philology, although it's published later. Um, and I, th I think it's got all the trademarks of the Gardner's teaching, but it's also got a lot of Pete's thoroughness and this sense of culturally embedding the maths not in not just into the text but also into Egyptian culture as a whole and, and I, that is that I think shows he was more than just a philologist he, he had a, a breadth a holistic approach to Egyptian culture but it doesn't sound as if Neugebauer had to quite such an extent in, in the way he handled the maths is that is that fair? I think so, yeah. Neugebauer, like most of the historians of mathematics at this time, is very led by the mathematics. Yeah. So it's it's very striking to read Pete, who's, um, as you say, em embedding the mathematics culturally. And this is it's particularly striking to read this in the 1920s because historians of mathematics were working very much in Neugebauer's style for, for most of the 20th century. So... Mm. Um, uh, so to see him saying this in, in the 1920s is, is, is very uh, um, uh, interesting. Um, interesting also that the historians of mathematics who seem to have been reading his work to some extent didn't pick up on this, this yes. anti-presentist uh, stance yeah. that he took. So it's, it waits until people like Helen Robson and Annette M. House and dealing with the ancients. Mm. Yeah. yeah, which is quite a long, long wait. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, I mean, how typical do you think Pete is of his time across historians, historians of maths? I don't think he's very typical no, at all. Yes. Uh, I think yeah. there's something in that, there's something in the combinations in his background that just makes him different from yes. people. I, I, I can't quite pin it down. No, yes, yeah, no. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, in the, uh, I've been looking at some of the other text editions, and I think the rind is typical of his text editions, but it goes that bit further in contextualising it. And it, it's intriguing to compare it with Gardner, because Gardner um, was the great philologist of the 20th century, and you can see similar, except the photographs with this edition, similar features to the, the rind edition. It's basically the text with very detailed annotations on the readings of the text. It's firmly anchored. Um, 
what Gardner doesn't do with this is go beyond providing the basic publication of the text. Um, and as you know, I'm obsessed with this because this is the, the tale of Sinuhe, which is the hamlet of ancient Egyptian literature and the undisputed masterpiece um, of that culture. And Gardner, again, it's very characteristic. He's, he's of his period. He does a very Berlin style school of publication. But this volume only exists because Gardner was working behind the scenes. He had been entrusted with the Ramesseum Papyri, which he gave to the British Museum, apart from the Ramesseum Papyrus of the Tale of Snuhe, which he gave to Berlin, so Berlin could be persuaded to finance the publication. And almost all of the surviving manuscripts of Snuhe are somehow acquired and preserved through Gardner's money and generosity. Um, I think where he differs from Pete is he's slightly more of his time, perhaps. His commentary volume, which is essentially what I'm spending my career trying to redo, it's old-fashioned philology. Um, he doesn't have an understanding of the manuscript culture. There's no sense of material philology. Um, but what it does is really establish the basis of the interpretation. And when he comes to the literary aspects, infamously, the two pages right at the end going, mm, it's literature. Um, and all he can do is turn to Kipling as a great author to, to, to get a, a literary viewpoint on the tale, which is you know, not... Um, shows the limitations of his literary sensibility, <clears throat> I would say. Um, but what's been, why I'm thinking about this now is the more I've worked on the commentary, the more crap you realise has been written since and you go back and Gardner got it. Not the literary aspects, not the ambiguity, but he really, really knew Egyptian. And there's that embeddedness that you seem to find in Pete, but then Pete goes that step further and actually gives it a modern twist. And Pete produced a comparative study of Egyptian literature, um, which has some of the, the attitudes of the time, saying it was more poetry in a single line of um, Keats or Shelley than there is in a whole ancient Egyptian poem. But then he says, but we've got to be so humble because we don't understand it. And I can remember talking with you over lunch that that was sort of, you were going, oh, it sounds like his, his work on that. And I think that's, that I think is where Pete sort of moves slightly beyond the limitations of his period. So it's, yeah, figures like Gardner really haunt the subject and Pete is, he's sort of the professor who got away. I think he, he's the, the hope for Egyptology that didn't quite materialise. Yeah, so, so Pete's approach to ancient Egyptian mathematics was this very much a, an, an anti-presentist view, to use Claire Lewis's yes. word, a very useful word, um, in which the, he's admitting a, a cultural element to to the mathematics, unlike people like Neugebauer, who are taking mm. a very um, platonic view of the subject. The mathematics is out there to be discovered, and therefore ancient mathematics, modern mathematics, they're, they're not so different because it's the same mathematics lurking in the background somehow. Um, and this is the, the view that, that persisted for a very long time. But Peter's uh, um, it, is looking to the, the the wider context in which this yes. reference is sitting. Yeah, I think again it's partly Gardner, but I think it's that breadth of approach from from the mathematical training, even though it was only up to mods, but also the archaeological experience. And I think that's something that the Pete Libraries try to keep alive still. I mean, Pete was obviously much loved by his family, and they've given us donations of artifacts from some of his early excavations to sort of personalise the collection. And on the basis of that, of course, we've put on a display of the college's Mason collection from the 19th century of artefacts, just to try and get people away from the abstract library driven approach to the subject, back to the papyri, like Pete and Gardner to force people's faces into the manuscripts. And having worked at the British Museum, I know people edit manuscripts often without actually 
bothering to come and look at them like you did with the Rhine Mathematics book Paris. And I think seeing from the library objects, as you said, working is a wonderful way of continuing that process of embedding the culture. It reminds people of the actual materiality that exists behind our sort of imaginative reconstructions. Um, and I think the new display and the new library here gives us a wonderful opportunity to keep that sense of the culture as material, as a world in itself, not just people's abstract musings on, on the subject. And of course, the main Egyptological library in the university is based on Griffiths, now in the Sackler Library. The college in memory of Pete keeps up this wonderful secondary source, which is also, of course, available to absolutely everybody across the university and really tries to encourage the sort of cross-disciplinary dialogues. That is the only way Egyptology can actually progress is by pulling in people who know about the maths and getting them to tell us what it means. So, no. Thank you. Thank you.